Grace is something that is going to actually protect us. How do you accumulate this grace? I mean, do you carry it? Because this is one of the things that is always told to us that some people carry their grace from their previous birth and do something good now so that you will carry this grace to next birth. Is that so? I, I, whoa, whoa, what is this? Whoa, 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 you're going away too far. <laughs> <laughs> See, grace is available to everybody. It's like sunlight. Sunlight is available to everybody. But only those, those who open their eyes will see. <laughs> That's the way it is. But is it not there? Is it there only for me, not for you? There's no such thing. It's available for everybody. It's just that, are you receptive? When we talk about receptivity, see the entire process of yoga. The word yoga itself means this. The word yoga means union. Union means what? Right now in most people's experience, it is me versus universe. This is how people are experiencing life. Otherwise, why continuous anxiety, fear, they think they are fighting for their life all the time. Why? They are fighting the whole universe. Individual and the universal, Being in competition with the universe is a stupid thing to do. Hello? <laughs> no? Yes. It's a bad competition to get into. Hello, you must show some sign of life, otherwise I'll have doubts. <laughs> Hello? Yes. What will you do if your patient… <laughs> what will you do? He has to show some sign of life, isn't it? <laughs> Because your orthopedics, uh, if you press on their pain points, of course they'll come alive. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I don't have such a privilege. <laughs> you versus universe, a bad competition to get into, isn't it? So yoga means this, that you consciously obliterate the boundaries of your individuality, that if you sit here, there is not much distinction between what is you and what is the universe. On another level, see as we sit here, this is my body, that is your body. Do what you want, these two things will not become one. This is my mind, that is your mind. Do what you want, these things will not become one. They may overlap on some issues and we may feel that we are one with each other. But my mind is my mind, your mind is your mind, isn't it? But there is no such thing as my life and your life. This is a living cosmos. You captured a little bit, I captured a little bit. That's about it. But now we think this is my life and that is your life, there is no such thing. This is a living co cosmos, you've blown a small bubble, somebody might have blown a little bigger bubble. Did you blow so bubbles when you were young? Oh yeah. You still do? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. So when you blew so bubbles, somebody had this big bubble, somebody else had that big bubble, Oh, went on saying, this is my bubble, this is your bubble, but poop it went. Once it goes poop, you did not say, this is my air and this is your air. Similarly, there is no such thing as my life and your life. There is just a living cosmos. If you capture more life, then you will see you have more grace. The depth, dimension and scope of your life is determined by how much life you capture within you. It doesn't matter what kind of body you have, what kind of intelligence you have, if you have not captured substantial life within you, you will live a small life, that's how it is. Mm. How do you do this? There are systematic ways of approaching this or simply by involvement and exuberance, by commitment people may capture a larger life. By absolutely being committed to something, focused on something, somebody may capture a certain amount of life which is more 
then what is considered normal. Mm. But yoga has a systematic process as to how to capture life. I can show you thousands of people around me today. <laughs> when they came, they thought they won't do anything significant, half of them, uh, not half, seventy percent of them are dropouts from schools and colleges and everything. But you will see after a few years of sadhana, suddenly they are functioning in ways that you won't believe possible. Recently we had a business, uh, you know, event called Insight, where over two hundred uh, CEOs from across the world are coming and participating. All of them wonder why our organizations don't run as smoothly and efficiently as yours. I said, that's because I all have all dropouts who are no good for anything <laughs> But they have devotion in their heart, they are devoted to what they are doing, that's all. Because they are absolutely devoted to what they are doing, they may not be MBAs, they may not be from IITs and IIMs, they are simple people, but because they are absolutely devoted, they do wonderful things. So, the question is, how much life have you captured? Always people keep wondering, oh, that guy is not as smart as me, how come he's more successful? You know, this is… this is going on in a whole lot of people's minds who think they are smart <laughs> Yes, always. Why is that guy more successful than me? I am smarter than him. Obviously, your smartness is not working because uh, just with one dimension of life, life will not function. The most important thing is, how effervescent and large is the nature of life that you've captured and every one of us have an unlimited access to it. But how much will we take depends on how consciously we conduct our life. Sadhguru, you said about life and that brings a big question what doctors have about life. Now they say we have one trillion cells in our body. Mm -hmm. And each of these cells is living by itself. And when you say a patient is no more, it's just that the brain dies after two or three minutes, but still a large part of his body is still alive. Yeah. So, and these cells, even when after the patient is dead, you take these cells and those put in them, a culture. Those of you who are all shaving every day, even after you're dead, we still have to shave you, you know this. Yeah, the, <laughs> the hair grows. That is why I'm ready, you know <laughs> Yeah, but so what dies when we die? So that brings the question, what leaves us? So where is this life in our body? Is it in our brain, our heart? And what is this life <laughs> you're talking? Is it in the spine or is it in… where does it reside? <laughs> There's so many living people, you can ask them <laughs> Where are they <laughs> I think uh, the religious beliefs have totally screwed up human mind so badly. Uh, wait, 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 wait <laughs> That uh, people cannot even know what's happening within themselves. They know… they know the geography of heaven. Hello <laughs> So, uh, people know what is the geography of heaven, where is God sitting, you know, how many children he has, when is his birthday, <laughs> everything they know. How come they don't know where is their life? Isn't it ridiculous? Hello? <laughs> because we were told, Swami, about the birthday of gods, but nobody is telling us where is our life <laughs> and what is it. <laughs> you are life, aren't you? Yes, yes, of course. I hear four people, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking all of you, your life? Yes. You must show some sign huh? <laughs> So, if you are life, I'm asking you, are you really life? Yes, yes, yes. So, how come we know so many things and we don't know what is the nature of our life? Now, if you asked why uh, if somebody is dead, still cells, some of the cells are active, as I said, dead bodies are given a shave 
up to ten, eleven days. Why this is so? What we are calling as life physically is a mechanism on many different levels. There is hardware and there is software. You are core of hardware, bones. <laughs> uh, the software is equally important. Otherwise, how would a cell know that it's a human cell, that it is not a pig cell or a tree cell or something else? How does it know? Because there is an entire software, there is memory, evolutionary memory, genetic memory, karmic memory, there are varieties of memories imposed on every cell in the system so that it never gets confused. If you eat dog food for three days, you will not become a dog, isn't it? <laughs> because the memory is entrenched in this. So there is a whole software. The software package is actually bigger than the hardware, much bigger. And uh, it is energized by what is we are considering as a life force. In yoga, we call this prana. It manifests itself in five basic dimensions. There are other forms to it, which gets too complicated. Five basic forms. These are called pranavayu, samanavayu, apanavayu, udhanavayu and vyana. These have different functions. Prana is related to breath, the respiratory action and thought process. If the pranavayu depletes, your respiratory action will go away. So immediately doctor checks and says, he's dead. They'll try to pump their chest. If he doesn't come back, he's dead. Respiration and your pulmonary action are very directly connected. Once respiration stops, that process will naturally come to an end. So pranavayu is gone. It's not like one after another they will go. They will go at the same time, but one goes means this is gone. If samanavayu goes, this is in charge of generating heat in the system. So once samanavayu starts receding, the body starts getting cold and it also starts becoming stiff. Once apanavayu starts receding in a major way, then <clears throat> the sensory aspect of it, we must understand this, you may check somebody's breath and declare them dead but they can still feel sensations. There have been any number of cases where people get terrified because a dead body moves a little bit. This has happened again and again, many, many times. That when he's been medically declared dead, there are twitchings in the body that happen in a very mild way because the sensory activity is still on. Still, life is not fully convinced that it's finished. It is still making an effort of its own. When Udhanavayu goes away, then the buoyancy is gone. When I say buoyancy, see, you may weigh seventy or eighty or whatever number of… I'm sorry, <laughs> maybe you weigh fifty or fifty-five kilograms. <laughs> I don't want the ladies to get… <laughs> whatever is your weight, you don't… Let's say you're very happy and alive right now, you don't feel fifty kilograms on you, isn't it? Hello? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it is there. If you stand on the scale, it is there. But when you walk, it is not there, simply because this udhana creates a buoyancy. It makes you less available to gravity. There are yogic practices to activate this. There's a whole school of udhan in China, where uh, you might have seen those movies, uh, Hollywood movies, uh, what is that, Crouching Tiger or something, something, what? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So these are Udan schools where they have Masri or Udana where they can float around a little bit. Well, little exaggerated in the movies, but becomes lighter, more buoyant body. For a martial arts fighter, to be buoyant is important. There have been many cases where certain ballet dancers and martial arts experts have shown what is physically not possible they have done by leaping up to heights, which all physicists believe is simply impossible. But they've gone beyond that level simply by creating more buoyancy. So udhana is in charge of buoyancy. Once udhana starts receding, suddenly body becomes heavy. Always it was the same weight. Weight does not increase, 
but you can feel the weight much more simply because udhana is gone. This doctors may know, maybe doctors don't do it, the people who work in the hospitals may know, carrying a live person and a dead person, there's a big a difference. difference. Simply because udhana is gone, there's buoyant… there's no buoyancy. The fourth dimension is called vyana, this is preservative in nature. If vyana recedes, even when you're alive, body will begin to rot. There are certain uh, types of snake venoms which can do this. If they bite you, you will not die, but literally parts of the body will start falling apart simply because vyana will recede and it will start falling apart. So, once vyana recedes, the rotting process will begin. There are systems in yoga where we want all the seven to go reasonably together, within one and a half hours we want it to go. In normal death, depending upon the age of a person, how vibrant a particular body is, it may take a long time. When I say long time, up to fourteen hours it may take. Vyana may take up to fourteen days to leave. This is the reason why in this culture you have rituals running up to fourteen days because they feel the vyana may be still there because when you bury a person, the vyana may be still hovering there, so up to fourteen days. That is the reason why within one and a half hours in this… <laughs> in this culture, that was the rule, if somebody dies within an hour and a half, you must cremate them. But then mistakes happened. When they were still alive, somebody put them on the funeral pyre, so they stretched it to four hours. Within four hours, you must create… cremate. But today, uh, there are issues, all kinds of issues about it. So, uh, people are waiting for one day, two days, daughter is in America, she has to come, she'll come after three days and uh, they will wait. But the idea is, for the one who is dead, we must understand this. You are… do you… you don't diagnose people as dead, you declare them dead, right? There's a difference. <laughs> So when you declare them dead, for you they are dead. As far as that person is concerned, in a way, all that's happened is he's disembodied, he's lost his body. All his life he lived thinking he's a body, never realizing the physical mass that we carry is an accumulation from this planet. He never realized that. When suddenly he slips out the body, he tends to hover around the body because he's lost his discriminatory intelligence. Once you leave the body, the discriminatory intellect is not there, so this tends to hover around that body. So in this culture we said, the moment we are sure that somebody is dead for sure, you must immediately cremate them because it's good for that dead, so they know the game is up. And it's also good for the living, you will see, if somebody very dear to you is dead and their body is here, you keep on hallucinating. Maybe they're just sleeping, maybe they will sit up, maybe some miracle will happen, maybe something else will happen, you know, this will go on unnecessarily. You will see people are crying and uh, big emotional drama is happening, but the moment you cremate them, you will see everybody become silent. Have you noticed this? Always. Because now everybody knows the game is up. It's for the living and for the dead. So about life leaving the system, it is so entrenched. It is not something, poop, it'll go away like this. In stages, it goes away. Because it's in stages it came in, it's in stages it'll go away.
ಮೂಲಕಾ 